You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Tour de France, brought to you by iWoka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. iWoka.co.uk. Today we're at Puy Marie Cantal. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I am with Le Doyen de la Salle de la Presse. Well, I'm, I'm Francois le- Thomaso. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm less and less a doyen of the salle de presse because we don't very, we don't go very often to the press room. But yeah, le doyen and Lionel Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Hi, hello. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I, I, but you just jumped in there, Francois, when I said le doyen de la salle de la presse mm-hmm. you jumped in assuming it was you I might have been talking about Lionel <laughs> incredible laughter there from Francois there was no no chance that that would be me no well, this, I think this is my 18th full tour Richard so I mean you're heading towards doyen status I've got a doyen haircut <laughs> it's all fallen out <laughs> Oh, well, we're, we're in the, where are we, Lionel? I, I don't need to say that because we're in this, more or less the same spot as last night. We're just a little bit along from where we were last night, in the centre of Clermont-Ferrand, which is really busy, bustling town, Friday evening. Everyone's finishing work. People are having an early dinner or a, a post-work drink before heading home. And, uh, yeah, it's a lovely balmy evening, quite warm, isn't it? I continue to be quite impressed by Clermont-Ferrand, especially, we didn't mention last night, but the trams, very modern trams. Any city with trams is enhanced by those trams, in my view. Well, trams, yeah, they're all the rage in France. It's funny Not because... Not the Arkea Samsic tram of last <laughs> year. <laughs> no, no, it's true. It, many, many cities have... Uh, it's funny because they had trams in the 1930s and they got rid of them to, uh, to favour cars and buses and stuff. And now, and now trams are back in the force. Dr. Beeching got rid of them all <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> Le médecin. <laughs> you, you know what? It's a, funny, it's a funny fact and I have to say it because we are often go in the Pyrenees in, in places like Axe, Le Terme and, you know, all these valleys we go uh, across, uh, you know, between the, the mountain pass to the Tomali and all that. There are trams there in 1920s, 1930s going from town to town. So it was much more modern than we think now. Very civilized. Well, it's mm. lovely. Uh, we only had to venture about half an hour up the road for the start today. Then we came back here and the stage starts right here tomorrow. I took a little bike ride up to the, the foothills of the Puy de Dom and we're actually where the, the race will go tomorrow. A very tough start tomorrow, uh, climbing straight out of uh, Clermont-Ferrand on a, on a kind of uh, strange stage tomorrow. Uh, definitely a transition stage tomorrow but what we saw today was a bit of a a cracker a lot of people were talking about this stage as being one of the most interesting and difficult and one that would prove to be a a gc battle which it did and and more than confirming who's going well it, it kind of almost eliminated a couple of people as well, didn't it? But what happened, Lionel? What's the tale of the attack? Well, stage 13 from Châtel Guillon to Puy-Marie, up and down all day, seven categorised climbs, and today we had another first-time Tour de France stage winner, and, as you say, a shake-up in the GC, which suggests that, for the moment at least, the two Slovenians, Primoz Roglic and Tadej Pogacar, are the strongest two of the GC riders. It was a really aggressive start. I mean, if you watched all day, as I, I think we more or less did watch the whole of the stage from start to finish. The first hour and a half and the last hour were absolutely riveting. Um, there were loads of attacks at the start. Clearly, the composition of the break would set the tone for the whole day. Really important who got into that and, and, and who wasn't allowed into that. It took several attacks before a group of five got properly clear by the top of that first category climb, the Col de Cesa. Remy Cavagna, the local boy, and Julian Alaphilippe of the Koenig Quickstep Remy were in Cavagna, there. Nickname? R- Remy Cavagna, Remy Lasagna? No, the no. TGV of Clermont-Ferrand, because they don't have a TGV in Clermont-Ferrand, you know, the, 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 the fast train, and, uh, but they have Remy Cavagna. <laughs> well, he was in there with Julian Alaphilippe. Simon Geschke of CCC, one of our audio diarists, of course, we, was in we, there. We had two riders in the break. <laughs> we got two we riders in the break today. We did well, didn't we? We did a little <laughs> bit of pretend DSing at once, <laughs> didn't we? <laughs> yeah, if you could just get into the break and then not do too much work, guys, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> Throttle back a bit, please, Sivakov. Dan Martin of Israel Startup Nation was in there, as was Mark Soler of Movistar. And then there was a big counter-attack move behind, which, as you say, had Sivakov of Ineos in there. 
uh, Leonard Kamner and Max Shackman of Bora Hansgo. More of them uh, in a minute. Hugh Carthy, Nielsen Paulis and Danny Martinez of EFA uh, Pro Cycling. And then the French had Warren Barguil, Pierre Roland and Roman Sicard. A special mention to Valentin Madouas, who spent a long, long time riding across what was becoming a bigger and bigger gap from the bunch to the break. He made it and then spent a while out in front on his own as well. And then at the finish got fourth. I mean, a real super ride by Madouas today. There was a period where Paulus of EF was off the front by his own. Then Shackman caught him. Mark Soler tried to counter, but I couldn't quite get a handle on his tactics today. Um, he certainly couldn't keep up with Danny Martinez when the uh, Colombian rider rode across and up to the front of the race. He's the recent winner of the Criterium du Dauphiné, of course. On the final climb, Shackman was out in front on his own, and then it was Martinez riding across the gap, really set about that job in a very methodical, classy way, especially having Leonard Kamner marking him all the way up, knowing that he was dragging one of Shackman's teammates across the gap. And then at the finish, he found himself the EF meat in a Bora Hansgrohe sandwich. I'm not sure whether, whether that <laughs> sounds particularly appetising. They all came together with 1.6 kilometres to go, which sounds like it was close to the finish, but actually it was about another five minutes of racing. It was a, uh, a really steep finish. Uh, Kamner, who'd been dragged up to that group, um, he, well, he may as well have signalled his intention to attack with a fireworks display. It was that obvious. The next couple of moves by Kamner were slightly less telegraphed. And in fact, his decision to open the sprint early initially looked like it might catch Martinez by surprise. But the Colombian, who looked great on that final climb, you have to say, came round him to win the stage. So over the line, it was EF first, Bora Hansgrohe second and third. And as I say, Madouas in fourth. The race for the GC behind uh, was the Pog and Rog show. Uh, Roglic and Pogacar eased clear. They distanced Egg and Bernal and then sort of ha there was a bit of a sort out behind. So if you look at the GC riders, Roglic crossed the line six minutes and five behind the stage winner with Pogacar just in his wheel. Richie Port, who's been riding extremely well, was 13 seconds back with Mikel Lander. Then came Miguel Angel Lopez, Egg and Bernal, the defending champion, who's lost 38 seconds to Roglic and Pogacar. Iran was with him then Adam Yates, then Quintana, De Moulin a little bit further back. A bad day for the French, unfortunately, Francois. Roman Bardet crashed, tore all his jersey and shorts and finished 2 minutes 30 down on the Roglic group. Uh, Guillaume Martin, who'd been lying third overall this morning, of course, lost even more time, not entirely sure what had happened to him. As you say, tomorrow, Richard, a bit of a transitional stage, but a sort out on the GC and Primoz Roglic is uh, tightening his grip on the yellow jersey you are listening to the cycling podcast brought to you by Iwoka flexible loans built for small businesses join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new height with Iwoka if you run a small business find out more at iwoka.co.uk i w o c a .co.uk Hi, my name is Mike Mooney. I run Hub Velo in Hackney, London. Hub Velo started about six and a half years ago um, in a very small shop in Hackney. The original shop was just a very small, as I say, a very small, it was actually a nail bar, <laughs> one of Hackney's finest nail bars. And the shop was very small, as I say, and we just had a, like, a bunch of bikes in there and a small workshop. Uh, and then business just really started increasing almost week on week we got busier and busier four years ago we bought a shop next door which is twice the size and we had opened a cafe and we have now have a, a big space a showroom uh, with a cafe for seating and it was at that point we decided to start uh, our cycling club so we probably much like any other small companies um, have cash flow is always an issue especially in the cycling world because it's very seasonal and in the winter months it, business just drops off like it gets the end of November and it's just like falling off a, uh, a commercial cliff everything stops it's very difficult to kind of maintain the business we have the same staff we have the same space we have the same outgoings so it's always very difficult to do that so uh, to, to maintain the, the business with, with obviously a decreased amount of uh, income and then I found out about Iwaka I found them online. I'd read a couple of reviews. 
And they had everything that I didn't have from the bank. And I had someone that I could talk to, they understood our business, they were young, they were keen, they really wanted to help. It felt like the perfect partnership. It's just been great. I mean, we've, we've got our first chunk of cash. We don't, we don't have an enormous amount of money with Ewoka. We don't really need an enormous amount of money. It's just to tide us over through that, as I say, that difficult period in the winter. And um, the relationship was, I actually have a relationship with Ewoka. Someone I can talk to, I know them, I've been to see them. They ride bikes, they're young, they're dynamic. They're all the things that we didn't have before that we wanted. Um, and that relationship has continued and, we, and that's been really helpful for us. Thank you very much to Iwaka, our title sponsor, whose support helps us be here covering the Tour de France as we do every year, as we've done every year since 2013, haven't we? Um, and we're very grateful to Iwaka. If you run a small business and want to find out a little bit more about what Iwaka can do to help you, um, go to iwaka.co.uk. As you said last night, Lionel, they've got very good reviews on Trustpilot, Iwaka, and one of the the benefits that customers speak of is that you speak to a real person when you make an application to iWalker. Um, now, well, today we had two sort of stories, the stage and the, and the GC, and both very interesting. And it was a very strong group uh, that, that formed, as you said, Lionel, we watched the, the opening skirmishes and it was clear that Julian Alaphilippe, well, it was clear that Remy Cavagna, the local, the local boy, wanted to be in that group, but also that Julian Alaphilippe was keen to be in it and also to make it quite a selection pretty early on. And he, he was very aggressive early in the stage, faded again at the end, as he's done a couple of times when the, the stage wind kind of drifts away from him. He, he kind of uh, throws out the anchor, doesn't he, a bit, Julian Alaphilippe? Well, uh, as, as Lionel said, you know, in his tale of the etap, uh, it, the, the, the French, uh, I mean, if the GC cards have been reshuffled a bit today, the, the French cards keep being reshuffled in this Tour de France. We lost... Slightly you know, dropped on the floor, some of the cards. <laughs> yeah, and, um, absolutely. Like, like, yeah. a, like a castle, you know, <laughs> card castle or something that kind of crumbled down. But, yeah, we, we, we saw... Well, Julien Alaphilippe obviously doesn't have the kick and the, the, the kind of form he had... Uh, uh, last year, so every time he tries, he doesn't. It's not too far, but it is obviously not li like they say. You know, sometimes in other sports, in the zone. You know, he uh, was uh, last year, and and it's the case obviously for, for for all the French guys. We 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 had you know great hopes in Guillaume Martin, who was doing who was doing well so far, being the in the provisional podium and he, he failed badly today at the end of the race he said he didn't know what what, what, what was wrong actually uh, maybe he crashed two days ago uh, it's it's very difficult to tell I mean all these guys we saw Quintana losing time today and he crashed Bardet losing time and he crashed uh, Danny Martinez you know who won the stage and was not the the, 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 the rider you know, the contender we expected to the, the, the impact of crashes you know wh whether used as diplomatic excuses or uh, uh, having a real effect on, on riders is difficult to tell. But from what we saw since the start of the tour, crashes obviously have, have, have a huge influence on the performances of the uh, of the riders. So Guillaume Martin obviously uh, hampered by that. And in the last climb, which, which was real murder, let's face it. I mean, you know, uh, you, 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 all the riders finished with. I mean, we saw Egan Bernal uh, losing time, but you know, staying on his bike, uh, you know, bent uh, on the on the on the guidon. <laughs> Uh, looking in a bad way. I mean, it was a very, very, very tough uh, old-school Tour de France uh, stage. And in and, and that last game, we saw Thibaut Pinot lose ground, we saw Romain Bardet who crashed, lose ground, we saw Guillaume Martin. Uh, uh, and well, from the French side, you know, it was kind of a disaster. But in the same time, uh, you, you've always got guys you don't expect. Pierre Roland has been in the top ten, uh, I, I think even the top five uh, for in the last uh, uh, two stages. So obviously in... in, in in good shape. You, men you mentioned Valentin Madouas, who is a Thibaut Pinot, um, you know, teammate who, who finished fourth. So, so, so there, there, there is now room. I mean, now that the GC situation gets a, a little bit clearer, there's room for stage wins, and we're going to see probably more uh, interesting action coming from all over the place for the, from, from the guys who don't stand a chance in the GC. Last little uh, remark, you know, we we're playing down these guys, you know, Bardet, Pinot, all the guys who crash, Robert, uh, 
who run or think you know favorites with we, we think are not doing that well but but the the worst off of all these guys Thibaut Pinot uh, um, you know we, we thought was he's actually 24th in a GC which is not <laughs> which is not a bad result and and at the end of the day even all these guys who lost lots lots of time through crashes and you know being not the, the kind of guys we're expecting them to be might end up in the top 20 or the top 15 24th he might as well still be in Nice Francois <laughs> ben, <Come> over, <laughs> ben over the guidon it's a, a rare example of Francois using a, a French word there instead of an English one but um, let's talk about the stage first we'll talk about the, the GC a bit later on um, you know there were some teams in that break with multiple members in it and I think Simon Geschgar audio diarist um, has has mentioned already we'll, we'll if we don't hear from him in this episode we'll hear from him in the next kilometer zero uh, with the audio diarist but you know he talked about how difficult that made it for the the freelancers i suppose um, you're looking at those teams to really make the race and they couldn't quick step with a couple of riders there um ef were really well represented there and bora hansgrohe and and really it was up to those those teams um we saw uh nielsen paulus kind of Uh, get away on a descent um, and then and, and, and press on and, and it was Max Schachman who was away yesterday as well bridged across to him and that was uh, well we'll hear from Tom Southern this, the sports director at EF that was a little bit of a tricky situation for them because Schachman was clearly the stronger rider there their strongest man was Danny Martinez and they had this question or problem of how to get Martinez up there the the problem was solved by Paulus actually being dropped by Schachman and that opened it up for um, Martinez to, to bridge across which he did with Kamna and coming into the finish which we, we were all watching um, it, as you say Lionel it was a really steep murderous climb and it was funny because Martinez who's out of the GC picture he it was like he was riding for GC he, he seemed to be only focused on you know grinding away he didn't seem to be really paying a lot of attention to the riders he was with now they dropped Shackman um, it was like a time trial it was like he was going to ride like the final bit as fast as he possibly could without paying attention to what was going was on odd. around him I uh, mean he was just obviously that much better I suppose but Kamnob jumped and he didn't he, he was looking the other way and we were oh my god he's blown it yeah. but there was enough because the road was so steep there was enough time for him to come back yeah I think he knew and he said it actually uh, 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 after the stage he knew he was the stronger the strongest of the three uh, he's, he's, he's seen it he felt it and he knew that the only way if he, if he had tried to play it clever or you know cunning and waiting for them and playing cat and mouth he, he probably would have lost it and he knew he was simply the stronger g the guy And so and so, it just it just carried on. You know, he, he went he went at his own pace, and the others couldn't follow. It was a great great teamwork to the Bayef Pro Cycling. We all have a soft spot for uh, for for that team, and sometimes you have really bad luck, sometimes really good luck. And but today, uh, really, I mean. It was, it was timed perfectly with Nilsson Paris, uh, you know, uh, attacking early. You, 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 Carty was, was there, you know, to to help around if needed. Well, he did he a well, great yeah, job, I mean, didn't he? Getting exactly. Martinez into he, that. It, it yeah. was yeah. obvious yeah. that you know they were they were setting up uh, Martinez for the finish. G great. I mean, it, it's it's nice because we've seen uh, with Sunweb uh, yesterday with Urshie's win, today with EF Pro Cycling, and even with Bora Arnoldsgro, uh, even if they've lost it. But I mean, there, there are great team tactics, you know, around uh, you know being played there, and 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 the lack of domination by by a team like Ineos in the past, and the fact that Jumbo Visma are, play, are playing it uh, in a more relaxed way, I think, than uh, than Ineos used to, you know, leave space for for teams to maneuver a little bit, and. Uh, And I think that's exciting. That's very interesting to see. Uh, Bora, uh, we'll go back to EF in a second because they, lo they win it, won it today. Bora seems to have lots, lots of options now that obviously today they, they gave up on the idea of, on the idea of all for, for Sagan. And, and they have so many options. Shackman is go, you know, getting back in shape that uh, they, you know, they're in for... I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a Bora uh, stage win in the, in, the, in the third week. Well, I think the fact that Buchmann is out of the picture gives Kamna and Shackman more of a free reign rather than... I mean, Sagan was not going to do anything on a, on a day like today, I don't think, was he? Unless, unless he got in that 
unless he got in that break right off the off the bat. But just on EF, you mentioned. I mean, they really did. They really did work very well together. Not just once or twice, but you know, three times. There was a period where Hugh Carthy was doing a, a lot of work to 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 make sure that you know they had the three riders in that group. And and well, we know that numerical advantage in a situation like that gives you so much more so many more options to play with and uh, Richard you said about Paulus you know the problem being that maybe Paulus wasn't the strongest you know wasn't stronger than Martinez clearly wasn't but what a fantastic position to be in to know that you've got somebody up there you can almost play leapfrog to get your preferred guy up there much better that position than being in one where you've got no one up the road and and it's just all on the shoulders of one rider I mean that Bora were in the same position as well with Kamler and Shackman it just didn't quite work out for them no but as I said last night one of the really fascinating things about the sport I think is that there aren't any teams here who are who are who are just here to get in meaningless breaks. Uh, they're all kind of here with serious objectives, um, and I think that's a, quite a big change. And it means that stages like today's are opportunities for for everybody to do something. And we see the racing is just so full on right from the start, you know. And there's nothing controlled about it at all. I think there's got a scooter race going down the uh, the tram lines here, um, but I find it so interesting because those those that race kind of happens. It's almost separate to the GC race, but it has an impact on that, and it had an impact on the way that Jumbo Visma had to ride and mm. how hard they had to ride today. Even, even teams like B and B B Hotel Vital Concept uh, that, that, that in, at, at the beginning of the Tour de France we would have thought, well, they're going to go in the breakaway just to show the jersey. Well, they do more than that. They, they, you know, Pierre, as I said before, Pierre Roland was again uh, uh, up there. They, they, they really, I mean, teams are really going for stage wins, even the smaller teams, which is interesting and exciting. Uh, about uh, EF Pro Cycling, I'm always amazed, by the way, by uh, Rigo Uran because I mean, we, we, he's, a, he's a kind of rider that every time we, we, we kind of, you know, we, we, we tend to look down on him a little bit because he, he's never kind of attacking, but he's so consistent. And now look at the, the, the GC standings without any flash or exuberant riding or anything. He's up there and I don't think he will be dropped in the Alps or dropped I, at I any was, stage. I was told by our EF Pro Cycling staff member this morning, Matt Rabin, that um, <laughs> Rigoberto Uran's uh, performance here is the story of the tour, given the <laughs> maybe cra- his maybe not, but I mean, y- mm, y- top uh, five finish mm, is, yeah. is, is yeah. probably. Interestingly, I was talking to Charlie Wigalius, Tom Sutherland, Matt Rabin this morning at the start, and they were asking me who I thought would win today, and um, I, I forgot to ask them who they thought would win today. <laughs> Yeah, they would have said Danny Martinez. <laughs> I well have done. Just on that point about the breaks, you're absolutely right, Richard. There's been there hasn't been a single soft break in this tour. The only day there could have been a soft break, there was no break at all. And that's a that is a very different Tour de France to, you know, we've I've often mocked. The, the break going up the road with one Wanty Group Gobert rider and one Cofidis rider or something and you're kind of you know what you're in for this tour has not been like that maybe at all maybe Jérôme Cousin you know uh, oh, every, every stage has, <laughs> has seen a proper race and a, and a great race almost like a one day every day has almost been like a one day race shall we hear from EF Pro Cycling yeah of course um, let's hear a little bit from our audio diarist Tom Sutherman and a, a, a guy who's been really visible and ridden really well at this Tour de France, Nielsen Paulus um, spoke to him quite a lot at the Vuelta last year when he was riding for Jumbo Visma he's moved and obviously has a lot more freedom there but another reason for speaking to him was a story that, that caught our eye a couple of days ago in Velo News by James Rea um, he's one of the first I think we think the second Native American to ride the Tour de France after Darwin Atapuma the Colombian rider and um, and that was something I wanted to speak to him about as well. So here is Nielsen Paulus uh, at the start of the stage yesterday. Um, spoke to you a lot of the Vuelta last year, but you seem to have come on a lot since then. Does that is that what it feels like for you? Yeah, a bit. I think that my my role has been slightly different than it was in the Vuelta last year. I think in the Vuelta it was a lot of riding on the front and uh, just sitting in and conserving energy. And when I couldn't do something for Primos, then we uh, had to let go. But that was mainly because he was already in a position where we had to defend. So. This year, there's a bit more freedom for the for the guys uh, supporting Rigo to um, either chase after Team GC or maybe chase after a result for the team. 
um, while Rigo can benefit off the, the work of other teams. Yeah, we've seen you on the attack, obviously, and go pretty close. I mean, do you look at your old teammates sometimes and see the, the job that they're doing here and, you know, feel glad that you, you made the move that you did? Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm super happy being at NEF, for sure. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I'm able to find satisfaction if I were riding on the front or chasing after a stage win myself. So at the end of the day, as, as long as I'm riding my bike and uh, doing what the, what, the, what the team has asked me to do, then I'll be a happy guy. But uh, yeah, it's also just, it is quite nice sometimes when you can feel that competitive fire again and um, chase after a stage win. And I, I think uh, physically the strongest guy did win in the past couple days in the breakaways, but um, hopefully there'll be another chance soon enough. Yeah, are there other stages that you have, you know, looked at fancy having a go again? Uh, it's too hard to plan like from far out like that because uh, we don't know what's happening with the GC or Team GC. So really, uh, in, even in the past days in the breakaways, I hadn't planned on going into the breakaway until until about an hour before the start because uh, it just sort of uh, fit in line with the team plan and the team director just gave me the, the go ahead. Uh, so yeah, I really just... Uh, can't really plan these things from too far out. I think uh, you can try to plan uh, moves on GC from far out, but in terms of breakaways and leaving your GC rider behind, that has to uh, that has to come from up top. And um, yeah, only when your director thinks it's okay and safe. Fascinating story in Velo News by James Ray about your 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 status as the first Native American to ride in the tour. When did you become aware of that? Um, I don't know. I guess just previous, like a few days before the tour, just uh, looking around and. I know uh, Darwin Adapuma was uh, a native from, I think, Colombia, but um, from America, and the, or from the United States, I would, I would be the first Native American. So, um, yeah, it feels quite special to be, uh, to be a trailblazer in that end, and hopefully I can just be a good role model, role model for those watching. Is that sort of family heritage and history important to you? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, it's, uh, it was definitely an incredible like experience growing up with that that level of connection to the country and the people and like my grandparents and um, just all the experiences that we had growing up and just them being such uh, such an encouraging factor to me and um, just like completely self-made people and it's uh, it was uh, yeah I mean they, they taught my grandparents taught me a lot about just uh, yeah taking your time with things and working hard for them and not really expecting a handout for anything but just uh, giving everything you can to your goal and um, hopefully being able to one day achieve it and yeah I mean I guess uh, I'm here for uh, what my dream was so hopefully I can inspire other kids that uh, it's possible to to get to this level even uh, even if it's um, terrible odds <laughs> yeah the a uh, great day today um, out behind the break uh, Got, uh, got three in there to start with, which uh, is no small feat at the moment. I mean, everybody wanted to be in that break, and it was very hard to get into. Um, it was a long time before it really went. I think we did 46Ks in the first hour with a huge climb. Um, we could see the guys were good, Hugh and Danny, and Nielsen's been uh, really, really solid at getting those moves. So once they'd gone, it, I mean, it wasn't... It's, much to think about tactically, especially because the finish was so hard. Um, so we kind of let it play out, <coughs> um, and without you know there being too much focus on the, on us with three guys in there. Um, and then Nielsen sort of chipped off, um, and then Shackman came across, which which was sort of the beginning of a bit of a tight spot for us really, um, because Shackman obviously had. Um, better legs than Nielsen and uh, got rid of him on the, before the, the real final climb started um, and so then that, when Danny was having to come across with, he just had Cameron in the, in, in the wheel basically the whole time but I think uh, when we got to 5k to go to the base the last climb he'd been pulling to 6k's with uh, Cameron in the wheel and uh, he kind of tried to attack and basically, uh, Danny closed them so easily from there. I kind of said to the mechanic, it's a done deal, like he's going to win because he just had the best legs, and that's what counted on a few starting today. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty cool. Great effort by uh, all the guys. Back into the leader of the team's class, so that should make things a bit interesting over the next few days. Yeah, a good one. Shoot, 
de chute à l'arrière du peloton. Cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. This episode is sponsored by the next generation Watt bike, Atom. Let's hear from another cyclist whose training has been revolutionised by riding a Watt bike. Yeah, today we're going to hear from Steve Cooper, who, like Chris Scott, who we heard from earlier in the tour, has used the Watt bike to recuperate, in Steve's case, from a hip resurfacing operation. I guess going back to, I think, 2018, I had a game of football and I felt something go in my hip. Consequently, attended the, doc- the doctors. I got referred to a specialist who administered the news saying, you need a hip replacement. And I said, what? I'm, at, well, I'm like 41 years old. So it came as a, bit, a little bit of a shock. And then it was a, a case of finding the right surgeon. I booked myself in end of December 2019. So once I knew I was booked in, it was just the case of having that date marked in the calendar and thinking, how do I re- recover? Having the Watt bike uh, in the background looking at me, before the operation, I thought, right then, as soon as I as soon as I can get back on, um, I will. And I had a little bit of a training plan. I talked it through with the surgeon, and he said, yeah, one of the best things you can do is, is getting on a bike and getting that movement back into the hip and strengthening it again. So that's the route that I went down. So the Watt bike was a little bit of a, a saviour, although um, it, it was it was a mentally difficult thing to get back on it and get going again. Three weeks uh, post operation, I went on a little bit tentatively. I didn't clip in. But uh, I got on with my trainers on and I thought, right, I've got to give this a go. It was a case of, right, I, I want to conquer you. I actually had a vasectomy as well at the end of February. So it was a case of, right, get myself back up to a <laughs> slight, you know, slight improvements. And then I was in end of February um, for the vasectomy. I didn't really want to sit on a sit on a bike for a couple of weeks. So I'd say the end of March till now, I've noticed real improvements in my cycling more so than ever before. But because... I've got quite a lot of determination. I don't like to be beaten. And I think, right, okay, how can I improve here? And the Watt bike has generally really helped me. Richard, when you had your hip replaced a few years ago, how soon were you back in action? You're you're walking immediately, uh, walking on the night of the operation. And then it's, you know, as much movement as you can tolerate, really. The, The rehab's about six weeks. I can't remember how long it took me to get back on a bike, but if I'd had a... A watt bike or a stationary bike available, I think I would have been on that pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the, if you have an operation like this, one of the, the things that's often happened is that you've lost a lot of strength in that leg. And so one of the really interesting things for me about the, the watt bike last year was the pedaling effectiveness score again and the balance between the right and the left leg just to see uh, how much work I still had to do because the rehab does go on for a long, long time, years often in order to just get the balance right between the right and left legs again. Well, I think Steve's story um, just shows how versatile the Watt bike can be and how helpful it can be, not just for improving as a cyclist, but in his case for recuperating from an operation as well. So the Watt bike Atom is available now from £90 per month. And if you'd like to find out more, go to wattbike.com, W-A-T-T-B-I-K-E.com. A little bit of housekeeping before we turn our attention to the GC battle. Uh, on Monday, we'll do our second press conference. Uh, send in your questions, please. Email. Audio files are preferred, so we can hear your voice. Contact at thecyclingpodcast.com. Send us in your audio files with any questions that you like at all. The second batch of Stacy Snyder's cups and mugs to benefit the Joy Riders in London and Pichun in uh, Toulouse will go on sale at some point next week. We'll keep you posted about when. Um, but she's working on them just now. She's also working on a one-off uh, cup, um, a Peddler de Charme cup. We haven't, we didn't come with Peddler de Charme t-shirts this year because we weren't really sure what the situation would be, um, how easy it would be to get things to riders. Well, impossible, really, in a way. Yeah, I mean, impossible. we'd have to hand them over with tongs and some <laughs> some uh, some washing two, powder, two meter long tongs. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so so we didn't do Peddler de Charme t-shirts this year. Hopefully we'll uh, resume with those next year or the year after. But um, Stacey's very kindly offered to make a Peddler de Charme mug. So send us in your nominations for a Peddler de Charme. That'll be a Peddler de Charme for the whole tour. Um, so we want a really special one, I think. She's, so, she's done a, a one-off design. It looks fantastic. And I'm sure the recipient will be very happy indeed to receive a Peddler de Charme mug. Before we go on to the GC battle, Rich, uh, Danny Martinez, his career progression in terms of his, his World Tour wins is, uh, well, it's the story of French stage racing, really, because last year his first World Tour race win was a stage of Paris-Nice mm-hmm. in 2019. Of the, of the Tourigny 
Bass. On and, the uh, Carini, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this year, he won the overall in the Critérium du Dauphiné, as we mentioned, and now, of course, a Tour de France stage win. And it's the first Tour de France stage win for that team organisation since Rigoberto Uran in the Alps in 2017. And, well, Uran will probably be feeling pretty happy tonight because he was really on the coattails of the, uh, the the Slovenian pair Roglic and Pogacar and just to make the point that the overall at the moment the top six the first two are Slovenian and the next four are Colombian I mean uh, it's extraordinary to see that really uh, Bernal, Uran, Quintana and Lopez lining up behind Roglic and Pogacar yeah Inter Adam Yates in the, in yeah, the first uh, non-Colombian or That's Slovenian right, I was about to say that. <laughs> interesting to see Adam Yates still up there when we kind of, uh, you know, ruled him out of uh, contention forever. After well, it's, that, it's funny to see him hanging on uh, hmm. as long as possible when his goal apparently is to go for stage wins. But I guess when you're, you know, when you're in the top 10 and he's moved up a place a day, up to seventh overall, that's a hard thing to let go. Um, you know, for the, 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 the you know the not not the fantasy but it, the chance of winning a stage but it's hard to win a stage as we see every day and um, whereas if you're in the top 10 you can hold on to that that's that's a great result mm. yeah he, he obviously has the legs to stay not with the very top uh, riders but but you know the, the top 10 riders of, of the climbs why should he decide to lose suddenly lose 15 minutes to win a stage it would be it would seem a little bit it dumb would. at this stage so today listen we saw Jumbo Visma really take control of the stage quite early on and, 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 you know, do quite a lot to just keep that break pegged at five, six minutes or so. And there were questions being asked about whether they were doing quite a lot because there's, there have been doubts about the form of George Bennett, Sepp Kuss. Um, you know, Robert Hessink seems very reliable and dependable. Tom DeMula also, you know, he's there some days, not other days. Um, and so there was, a, the, you know, this kind of question about whether they were they were taking on too much, cause given that there's still quite a long way to Paris. Later on in the stage, we saw the Ineos Grenadiers uh, really take it on as well and, and ride very aggressively in the kind of closing stages of, of, of the race, as if they were setting up Bernal to do something. And in the end, once again, the, the man that, that lit the bonfire was Tadej Pogacar. You know, he mm. has been the most aggressive rider in the top 10. His reward for that is to move up to second overall, but he was really swinging in the final few hundred meters. It was a very, very hard climb. And Roglic, I thought, looked very, very strong indeed today. He showed no signs of weakness at all. You know, there's still a long way to go. And Bernal, he, you know, he, he cracked a bit today, he lost a bit of time. He's third overall, but he's at 59 seconds. And coming out of the second weekend, sorry, the third weekend last year with a week to go, he was two minutes down. So he's closer now than he was at that point. Yeah, I mean, I had a chat with Dave Browsford this morning, a socially distanced chat, and he's, he conceded that Bernal needs to be ahead of... Um, <laughs> why are you laughing? I'm just, I just love the qualification of that. No, well, I feel it's important, really. I mean, we're not puncturing the bubble, are we? And we should probably make clear that we're not puncturing I the bubble. Just I'm just assume that just you, know, we're, we're, you, you spoke to him two, two meters away. I was two meters shouting, away. I couldn't really hear what he said. So this this meter and a half is the rule. Meter and a half. Well, I was two meters away. I'll, I'll, playing, bring my, I'll, oh. take, my, I'll take my tape measure <laughs> to the start playing tomorrow. Safe. I can't really hear what you're saying, so this is, <laughs> this is just made up. No, <laughs> he had his mask on. I had my mask on. I mean, absolutely hopeless. I'm paint the scene a little bit more. <laughs> but um, no, he, he did concede that Bernal has to be ahead of um, Roglic going into the time trial in La Planche de Belfi. And I, we're always slightly reluctant to look all the way to the end of the tour because there is so much racing to be done before then. But Today was not a Bernal day at all. Um, I'm, I'm just surprised that Roglic has, uh, you know, opened up such a gap. I mean, it's 59 seconds now. The, the key thing about this tour is that it doesn't go above 2,000 metres very often at all. In fact, the only time it does, I think, is the stage to Meribel, where it goes over the Madeleine, which is 2,000 metres, and the finish itself at Meribel is 2,300 metres. That's getting towards the terrain where Bernal will be a bit, a little bit more comfortable, but that's not to write off Roglic. I mean, Roglic can operate at, uh, at high altitudes as well. He's won stages that have gone very high before. Um, 
but the, sure the, he's won ski jumps at that sort of altitude <laughs> as well. Yeah, he always, <laughs> <laughs> they always they always seem to finish down the bottom though, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> but but the thing is that uh, the thing is that um, Bernal didn't react when Pogacar went, and uh, Roglic did, and you know that tells us something, doesn't it? We're we're, we're no longer in the opening sort of you know thrust of the the gc battle we're getting into the towards the thick of it now and sunday stage two uh the grand colombia will tell us a little bit more but i i think you know roglic probably does still need to turn the screw a bit more but if you said now they go to la planche de belfi the time trial and roglic is is uh 59 seconds ahead of Bernard, you would say, well, fairly comfortable. I think the tour would be done. The real tricky one is, is 44 seconds over Pogacar enough? I mean, it's the, the, the pacing of uh, Roglic since the, the, the beginning of the tour has been perfect. I mean, we, we, we've said in the first week that he was kind of holding back. He was holding back. He, he seems, seems to be holding back a little bit. But I mean, t- today, ask, ask Pogacar if he was holding back. I mean, in, in, the, in, in the last climb, really Roglic seemed strong, even stronger than Pogacar. Absolutely, yeah. And and it is uh, so far in this tour, it's absolutely unquestionable that uh, Roglic is the stronger the stronger guy. It, it, it takes twenty seconds by twenty seconds, and 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 you know, uh, kind of uh, making a, a bigger gap with every stage. I'm sure he'll, 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 he'll you know he'll, he'll get some other guys out of the GC on the Grand Colombier, and 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 probably as you said, the the stage to Maribel is is really the last trump. Uh, in 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 uh, Bernal's uh, sleeve, you know, to try uh, and 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 you know and upstage and and kind of overturn the, the situation. So far, Roglic is is just riding the, the kind of the kind of you know what he reminds me in terms of the strategy and the tactics and the, and the way he's riding by taking little bits here and there and ri- and riding comfortably is the way Miguel Indurain w- was mm. riding his tours. Well, he's doing it in a very unfussy, unflashy way, isn't he? I mean, he just looked he comfortable <laughs> and fast. Yeah, Pogacar in that last. 800 meters last kilometer you know the first time in this tour it looked like the helmet strap was a bit too tight he on him on and he was he? he was he was he was gurning a bit but i mean he's in the white jersey now he's yeah. he's he's leapt above bernal he's it's now a slovenian one two and um you know we what, have this what? impression that when when pogacar goes roglic reacts and and now that they are d- direct kind of head-to-head rivals it'll be really interesting to see what happens on sunday roglic always in quite a low gear it always looks like he's got another gear and um, that he can choose but we were talking last night that it, does, it has looked as if Roglic has been very conscious of the fact that it's a three-week race and, it, and in the past well the Giro last year you know his form has has dipped and you know it has looked as if he has been holding back a bit and you know as 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 we go get closer to the end um, his confidence will grow I think and it, he'll be less bothered about that and I think yeah today was was the most impressive day I think from Roglic and I mean the the whole Slovenian story is absolutely fascinating and the, there's another Slovenian in the race who's been riding very, very well Luka Mezgic who rides for Michelin Scott you spoke to him at the start yesterday uh, Francois Let, let's hear a little bit from Luka Mezgic I look I was I was wondering how it feels for you to have all this first this is about Slovenian cycling I mean you seem to become one one of the leading nations in the sport yeah I mean it feels good uh, last few years uh, when Roglic starts winning and Pogacar coming in it's like maybe a lot more respect in the peloton as well for Slovenians uh, but yeah, it's good to to see all those uh, countrymen uh, to have such su- success. Why do you think it happens now that uh, you know you have a generation of riders doing better than than ever? Uh, I, I reckon it's just a coincidence. Like every time on uh, 20, 30, 50 years, uh, there's a good guy born who knows how to do cycling and. Now it was Roglic coming from ski jumping and also Pogacar coming actually from uh, all the junior uh, classes on. You're a different rider than they are, you're a sprinter. Uh, well, and you, you've been doing all right since the start of the tour. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm searching for my chances in the sprints. Uh, it's hard to be there alone, no sp- uh, lead out train and stuff, but uh, I'm trying my best and uh, yeah, I fight on. Top 10 placings almost at every bunch sprint. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just about the position. Like, if you see these sprints here, it's all very equal, and you just need a lot of luck to have gap opening in the end, and that you don't have to break. Do you think that might be an opening for you? I uh, really hope so. <laughs> the cycling podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for supporting the cycling podcast as they have done since 2016. Did you uh, take a gel with you on your ride up towards the uh, Puy de Dome? I took a gel. I didn't use it actually. I didn't uh, need it today. In the, in the, down, in, and in the descent? Not in the descent either. <laughs> it was a 27 kilometer ride. It, a lot of climbing. A lot of climbing. Mean, Basically, half of it climbing and, you, and half of it descending. You mean you didn't descend at all? You just kept climbing and you no, no, I did. I did. It wasn't a it was a. It wasn't a reverse Lionel Bernie ride. It was. A, it, was it wasn't a pudding powered downhill ride. It was a, an uphill and then a downhill. But I think you're going for a bike ride in the morning. Lionel. I will do. Yeah. May join you actually. Um, I'm going to try and find some flatter roads. I think. Well, yeah, I, I would recommend that because it wasn't a. A lot. Of, it wasn't a lot of fun actually. It's, climbing it's a out surprisingly big city. I mean, I don't really want to be riding for sort of half an hour getting out of town, but I think I've found a way to get out of town quickly onto some flattish roads and then do a little loop round on quiet roads. Yeah, and get back. The Michelin Man. He could. He, I mean, he could go down more quickly than you do. I'd you be know? mistaken for the Michelin <laughs> Man. Um, <laughs> oh, hey, wow. well, I haven't done the uh, wow. Science of Sport code, have I? Science <laughs> Uh, if you want 25% off, SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. Sorry, Francois, stole your thunder there. Before the break, we heard from Luca Mezgic. You were going to just say something yeah, the, about ju- that? Yeah, uh, I was just Im- uh, imagining, I mean, th- there won't be many sprints finishes left, but ca- can you imagine Mezgic, you know, uh, w- winning one of the little few sprints left? I mean, you, you would have had... Two, three stage wins by three different Slovenians in three, you know, different ranges. It would be absolutely amazing. I'm not saying he, he will, but I mean, he had lots of, you know, top ten finishes since the beginning of this tour. Well, looking forward to, uh, you know, well, to see him. Who knows? You know, get on the, the podium of stage or maybe win one. You never know. What about the best of the rest in the GC battle? Because uh, when uh, when Roglic, well, Pogacar, Roglic went a bit clear we all eyes were on Bernal in the white jersey he was six seven wheels back and the gaps were opening and uh, we saw Mikel Lander look good Richie Port looked really good didn't he I mean he he's been good in this tour but for the time loss in the crosswind stage uh, he would be higher up on the GC wouldn't he I mean he's currently lying in ninth place at 206 but he'd be up there. He'd be in the top sort of five. He'd be around fifth, fifth, sixth. He'd be, he'd yeah. Be, he'd be breaking up the Colombians there. He would. Yeah. Maybe maybe you mentioned um, of Bauke Mulema at this stage. Uh, with 13th uh, at the start of the, it was always being you know a very consistent rider in the Tour de France. Uh, we had also his chances in the in the Trek Segafredo team and uh, who crashed who crashed out of race apparently with a broken wrist today. But Richie Port is riding the last Grand Tour, certainly the last Tour de France, as the team leader. Richard, you pointed this out when we were watching the stage. He will join Ineos Grenadiers next year and will settle back into a support role. And it feels a little bit like he's racing with... um, a, a sort of joie de vivre and a, and a freedom, freedom that, that and, and a, sort of slowly yeah. li- we can almost see it lifting off his shoulders he's never seemed all that comfortable with that pressure to be a GC leader and yet now in his last outing in that role he, he is he's, race, he's riding really really well and you know third best of the GC riders today I mean uh, that's not to be discounted Lander I thought also looked good Miguel Angel Lopez I think will be uh, you know do his usual come into his own in the final week perhaps um, Uran looked fine and story then of the tour <laughs> well <laughs> as, I, as I am yes, Quintana I who 
who hit the deck as well with Bardet came off less seriously um, but a, probably a slightly disappointing day for Naira Quintana today yeah, he, he crashed twice I mean Quintana without uh, his two crashes would have been would also be uh, our, our, our little conversation was nearly interrupted by a guy who came past and uh, and you know who, uh, who said well we kind of elbowed uh, I mean it's the new kind of gesture of uh, you know coronavirus crisis Do you know who he was is the big boss of the tour, Jan Le Moyne. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, well, you know, I, I, I nearly... I was, you know, I was concentrating on podcasting. <laughs> I was concentrating on what Lionel was saying. Yeah, I was thinking maybe we could have we could have Jan Le, Le Moyne on the podcast, you know, <laughs> discussing the tour, but I mean, he went... Uh, well, anyway. Next time. Yeah. <laughs> bigger, bigger boss than Christian Prudhomme. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, 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 he's above Christian Prudhomme. Oh. He's, he's number two. You've got Mario Di Lamori. You've got Mario Di Lamori's son. And, and, and you've got Yann Le Moyner. He's the general director of the tour. Yeah. And obviously a friend of the podcast. Well, he is now. Any, any other business from today, chance before we move uh, further east tomorrow to Lyon and head towards back towards the Alps? Oh yeah, well, there's one thing I wanted to say, a small bit of local information, and it, which will go well with our, uh, uh, you know, the, the, I, I know lots of our listeners like the nicknames. Uh, have you heard about the Free of the Cantal? The first guy, the first guy uh, in, a, in the Tour de France who went up Pas de Perol uh, in France was a guy called Louis Bergot. And and he, and he did it twice. He did the 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 the, 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 the twice. You know, the tour went up Pas de Perol, and but the, 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 the race went on. There was no finish on Puy Marie. And um, this guy Louis Bergo uh, w- was leading the way because he's a local rider, and it was called La Puce du Cantal, the Flea of the Cantal. So I wanted to mention the, the, this guy because he was kind of pioneer uh, rider up, you know, Puy Marie, or at least part of Puy Marie, and uh, and he had a nice little nickname. And uh, there's also an, a little snippet of news about Lyon maybe not, uh, uh, maybe putting a bit of pressure on the Tour de France to be oh, slightly yes, greener than, than it that, currently is. That's uh, the sort of the story that, 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 that uh, the stories that's been going, uh, you know, in the, in the French press these days. Uh, there was an interview in the, in the local Lyon newspaper, Lyon where we're going tomorrow, with the new newly elected Lyon mayor who is a, you know, is a green, an ecologist uh, and um, it, it was played up a, a, a lot as usual on, on, the, on, on the internet and on social networks like, like you know, the, the headlines were you know, uh, Lyon is uh, you know, uh, ruling out to, you know, uh, hosting the tour again and, 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 the, and the mayor apparently would have said you know, that the tour was too sexist and uh, polluting but I, I read the interview in, in uh, Le, Le Progrès de Lyon, that's the name of the newspaper, it's, it's, it's much softer than that, uh, the, the Lyon mayor said the Tour de France has great French institutions a great race, it would be better if they were a little bit less sexist and it's about time they have a, tour, a, a women's Tour de France he said, and he said well and uh, you know the, the, the carbon imprint is not very good and they should improve that but I think that, that we can you know we can only agree with that I mean so but it was played up like oh Lyon you know uh, kind of a Cancelling, as is the, the you know the, the the trend these days, the Tour de France was not really the case, but it, it got played up because uh, uh, we had the municipal elections in France only two or three months ago, two months ago, and uh, there, there was a kind of a green uh, you know sweep of uh, the the big cities, and uh, and actually the, the the municipality of Rennes in in Brittany ruled out you know welcoming or hosting the Tour. The front stage next year when the tour starts from Brittany, uh, you know, green mayor uh, for the same reasons, kind of you know, no, not enough room for women and uh, pol- pollution, and and the mayor, the mayor of Poitiers was also a woman, and they have a team in Poitiers, a women's team in Poitiers, said that the next time the tour would come to Poitiers, she was hoping that it would be for the women's tour. So it, th- there's a kind of trend, you know, there, uh, and, well, and well, quite, you know, quite justifiable. It's very interesting because that, that will apply more, yet more pressure. Absolutely, of course, yeah. yeah. ASO and the Tour de France. Yeah. It's coming from all angles, you know, sponsors, uh, towns, the lifeblood of the race is kind of putting pressure on the Tour de France um, and speaking of uh, women's racing the Giro Rosa uh, started today in Italy um, the women's Tour of Italy and Lizzie Banks who presents service course 
for us. She's keeping an audio diary for us again. She did last year and she won a stage, uh, which made her diary fantastic. It would have been fantastic anyway, of course. But she's doing it again this year. Um, Trek Segafredo actually won the team time trial um, there uh, tonight. So um, it's off up and, ar- up and running and uh, we'll get a report from Lizzie. Um, we'll also have an episode of the service course dropping any day soon, won't we? We will. Yeah, just on that, Francois, I mean, I've been I'm, at the start of the year before um, the coronavirus crisis was even uh, something we'd heard about. I was working on a, 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 a something about the, the impact of the climate change on professional cycling, but also professional cycling's impact on the environment. Talked to lots of uh, experts, people whose uh, knowledge of these things far, far outweighs mine, and it, it is strange that uh, you know because it was prompted by the the wildfires in Australia, which uh, you know impacted on the races in Australia at the start of the year. We're now seeing wildfires in the west of America as well, in California and elsewhere, and uh, it was kind of like the you know the the existential crisis for an event like the Tour de France might be. Uh, might be you know significant uh, changes to the climate and um, it's interesting that 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 pressure is slowly being applied I mean some would say that the pressure is not being applied quickly enough but I think probably put together an episode of kilometer zero on this subject for next week uh, if possible if not then it will certainly uh, air sometime after the Tour de France absolutely yes I'm looking forward to hearing that line I've been working on that for a long time Let's wrap things up for tonight, shall we? Um, We didn't even discuss Mark Soler and his... He was obviously very strong today, but just seemed to to, to ride it wrong. And and, uh, let's talk about Movistar another day because they're having a little bit of a shocker. Yeah, it's it's, it's funny because, you know, every time I'm in the race, I call my friend Jose Luis Arrieta. And uh, he must think I'm dead or something because I haven't called him once yet. <laughs> so um, I'll, 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 I'll do tomorrow just to reassure him, you know, that uh, we're in the You're race alive and I'm there. And kicking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm alive well, and kicking. Until then, until then, uh, thank you very much, the Doyen and you, Francois. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah.